Hello everyone. This is um, welcome to the Earth Talk, uh, our, our special recorded version. Uh, I'm Dennis Murphy from the 20-year-old organization, Sustainable Silicon Valley. Um, that's me here. Um, our mission is uh, as a nonprofit think and do tank, uh, it's primarily focused on water use and reuse, air quality and mobility, uh, but we're also the big picture, conscious of the big picture of uh, leading a, uh, an equitable and sustainable life in the Bay Area and working to uh, fight off the worst impacts of climate change. This is a, uh, an Ed Hawkins warming stripe uh, extrapolation of temperatures over 12,000 years uh, with a little bit of the Anthropocene in the far right hand corner. And uh, you could see that uh, um, uh, there's been activity over the 12,000 years, but there's this huge spike um, once uh, I'd say uh, industrial age, about 1850 onward. And uh, so um, that's obviously causing problems and we're trying to deal with them. Um, we recently had a really big shoe, uh, to quote Ed Sullivan, um, Waterpalooza, um, and we'll be putting out recordings on that. A uh, lot of good uh, presentations and interviews and panels and everything else. Um, we also announced the first of the water roundtables, which is the logo in the middle. Um, and uh, that first one was on workforce deployment, civil tsunami, and uh, building, uh, building back a strong bench in an equitable way, uh, making water jobs uh, interesting and, and uh, uh, actually making them sexy and uh, really at kind of the high school level and making uh, students aware that, uh, um, you know, it's a really good area to be in uh, with there's a lot of, uh, lot of change and a lot of job satisfaction. The other thing we have is wet talks on the water side. Um, and we've had three of them so far this year and are planning uh, uh, many in the new year. And actually, Earth Talks uh, we have today is uh, something we've come out of that. Um, just a uh, brief thing about uh, sustainable life. Uh, this is our, our newest program, uh, recognizing uh, that sustainability is something that should be in our mind all the time uh, and just part of our regular life, doing the laundry, you know, making dinner, um, all, you know, just even buying decisions, uh, you know, really the has a, uh, there's a number of ways to go and, uh, but usually the best ways are, um, have really good sustainable impacts. Um, along with that now, uh, we've been a kind of a, what I'd call a wholesale organization for a number of years, but now we're, um, actually have individual memberships this year. And uh, that is something you can find out more uh, about on our website. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, benefits and value we're kind of bringing into that for your tax deductible contribution. Uh, a little bit about housekeeping. Oh, it's, it's not Waterpalooza housekeeping. Sorry, that's a leftover artifact um, from uh, last event, um, but uh, there is chat and Q&A, and uh, you may hit the occasional poll just as I hit, I keep hitting the mouse that uh, advances the screen. So, um, but we're back uh, now for the Earth Talk with Mary Chambers, and uh, I, while we switch screens, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, Mary. And... So take take the, over the screen, Mary, while I uh, All right. share I'll go this. Ahead and share my and, screen. Hmm? I'll go ahead and share my screen then. Yep, go ahead. And uh, so Mary Chambers 
is the chairperson of the Sierra Club California Sustainable Agriculture Committee. Uh, she has a uh, background uh, in sustainable agriculture, has an MS from Stanford, and as well as an MA in sustainable international development from Brandeis. Uh, she currently worked as a technical specialist agricultural markets at IDE Bangladesh and as an intern with the UN Development Program uh, Global Environment Facility in Ethiopia. So with uh, so anyway, we like in a lot of our uh, talks to get in the weeds, but today we're going deeper. So take it away, Mary. Yeah, even deeper than the weeds, we're getting down right among the, uh, the roots the, uh, and the soil. So thank you so much, Dennis, for that kind introduction. I'm really happy to be here today. It's great to be able to share this information with people and really bring to everyone an appreciation of the importance of soil. So let's go ahead and dive right in. I'm presenting today on healthy soil for a healthy planet, soil carbon agriculture and climate change. And I like to start off my presentation by asking a question, which is why is soil important? And that underpins the, the whole rest of the presentation and it really underpins much of the life on earth because soil is really vital for all life on earth. It's a vital source of that life because it contains a lot of nutrients and it's a home for different kinds of life, microbiology, insects, various different kinds of tiny animals. Um, so it holds a huge amount of biodiversity. And in addition to being a home for this biodiversity, it's also a physical foundation for pretty much everything we see around us, whether that's the roots of plants or whether that's buildings, streets, airports and bridges. It's a physical foundation for everything we encounter in our daily lives. It's also really critical to the water cycle, which I know is something that Sustainable Silicon Valley is uh, closely, closely involved in. It's able to absorb water when it has a healthy spongy structure. It stores that water. As water flows through the complicated structures of the soil, it purifies and filters that water. And then because it's storing water, it can release it for later use by plants or humans, which is especially important in a place like California that's so prone to drought. And critically to our topic today, it's also a major store of carbon and we'll dig deeper into that. So agriculture is the main way that I think most of us encounter soil in our daily lives via the food that we eat. It's all grown in soil or else eating things that grew previously in the soil. And agriculture is vital to our economy. It's vital to food security. And this is especially true in California where we see agriculture and its economic impacts all around us. And California agriculture is especially important to the whole United States. In fact, almost half of our country's fruits, nuts, and vegetables are grown right here in California, which I think is really cool. But this also means that agriculture has a big impact and a big footprint in California. It takes up over 43 million acres of land, and it's a significant contributor to greenhouse gases. In California, agriculture contributes about 8% of greenhouse gas emissions, and worldwide that figure is about 10% of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. But this big impact also means that it presents a big opportunity for climate mitigation, which is really positive. Before we dig into the scientific aspects of the mitigation and the ecological science behind agriculture carbon, um, I want to take a moment to remind us of the social aspects of agriculture and the environment. When we think about agriculture, we can't just think about the science behind the plant growing in the soil. We have to remember that it has other impacts on individuals as well. For example, recently during the COVID-19 pandemic, farm workers have been classified as essential workers, which is obviously true, and it shouldn't have taken a global pandemic for them to be acknowledged in that way, but it's nice to see it officially recognized, and it reminds us that there's individuals working in, in agriculture when we discuss it. So any changes that we suggest for agriculture or any practices that we support have an impact on these individuals as well. It also underlies the health of everyone um, in the US and in the world since the type of food and the quantity of food that's available to us is determined by agriculture. And it even determines the nutrition of that food. For example, if the soil is full of really healthy nutrients, it's going to be much easier for a plant to produce a fruit or a leaf that has those beneficial nutrients in it. Whereas if the soil is depleted and there's no nutrients for the plant, 
the food that it produces won't be nutritious either. And finally, all of these farming practices are carried out by individual farmers for whom farming is their career and their livelihood and you know what they what they've built their whole life around. So when we suggest changes, we have to remember that um, agriculture is not just about the science, it's also about the people. Getting back a little bit to the environmental impacts of agriculture, there's um, a, a big variety of environmental impacts. And some of these are global and some of these are more local. Some of them include acute local air pollution, for example, from fertilizer or animal waste, letting uh, releasing gases into the air where it can have local impacts, acute water pollution, such as um, over application of fertilizer, which is then washed away into rivers and creeks and eventually to lakes and oceans where it creates algal blooms. So you can see in this picture, this is a picture of some of the, uh, the Great Lakes and you can see these light green spirals are algal blooms. And those are really uh, harmful because the algae feeds on that fertilizer, it grows in these enormous mass of algae um, and then when it dies and sinks to the bottom it removes all the oxygen from that water and uh, kills fish and creates other harmful impacts. And um, another problematic impact of agriculture is when it expands, um, when it takes up new land, there's a loss of habitat and this leads to a loss of wild biodiversity, a loss of habitat for, for wildlife. And another thing that isn't so often thought about when we think about the impacts of agriculture and its problems is the loss of agricultural biodiversity as well. So we talked about losing the biodiversity of wildlife when agriculture expands, but when we practice agriculture in the way that it's often practiced nowadays in huge fields of just one type of, one type of plant, we're often losing more specific and more diverse varieties of, for example, potatoes or corn that used to be grown in various regions in the United States. When we only grow one type of potato, we're losing the kinds of potatoes that may have had different disease resistances or suitabilities to different climates or different water, uh, water levels. So losing that broad base of diversity that makes our agriculture more resilient to unexpected changes can really make um, agriculture much more fragile and less able to keep us safe and fed. So we don't have to look very far back into our nation's past to see a really dramatic example of the environmental impacts of agriculture. And here I'm talking about the Dust Bowl. You can see a picture of some of the impacts of the Dust Bowl here. And this was created in part by the overuse of tillage, of plowing um, of the fields and breaking up of the structure of soil, which then caused it to blow away um, and to completely destroy the fertility of a lot of these fields in the Midwest. And this was just devastating for farmers and for the whole country since it contributed to the Great Depression. And in fact, my mom, who went to high school in Southern California, went to high school with some of the children and grandchildren of people who had been forced to migrate from the Midwest because of this, um, this destructive event, and they just lost everything um, when this happened. So nowadays, there is an equally urgent and equally um, terrifying environmental problem going on, but it's less visible. It's a lot less visible than the Dust Bowl, but just as serious. And of course, I'm talking about climate change. So atmospheric carbon, uh, carbon dioxide is now over 410 parts per million, and by comparison, in a pre-industrial times, it was around 280 parts per million. So it's increased tremendously, which leads to climate change and all of its attendant problems, like drought, increased wildfire, et cetera, which we've seen the impact of here already in California with a very strange wildfire season, lightning storms. And yeah, we're, we're already seeing these really um, terrifying impacts. But how did we get to this point? Of course, we know we got there by burning fossil fuels and um, allowing that carbon dioxide to escape into the atmosphere. But there's other factors as well, including the destruction of ecosystems, including soils in those ecosystems, the destruction of forests through deforestation, releasing the carbon from those trees and releasing the carbon from the soil in, in wetlands, for example, when those wetlands are drained for development or agriculture. And then, of course, the degradation of agricultural soil, which releases carbon into the atmosphere. Globally, looking at these different activities that I've mentioned, agriculture and forestry activities generate around 24% of the greenhouse gas emissions worldwide, which is quite significant. So 
it's not all bad news. There are ways that we can tackle this problem and mitigate climate change. And I like to think of mitigation of climate change as like two halves of one coin. One of those halves is avoiding emissions while the other is removing emissions that are already in the atmosphere. In other words, sequestering carbon. So in order to avoid emissions, it's really important to use all the tools we have in our toolkit, replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy like wind or solar, um, protecting existing carbon rich ecosystems like wetlands, um, and reducing agriculture related emissions, including from soil carbon. Carbon um, or agriculture also has a role to play in the sequestering half of that coin. There is a lot of different options for sequestration. There's some new technologies that are still in the process of being proven that capture and store carbon from the atmosphere. I, I heard of one recently where they make the carbon into diamonds, which is pretty interesting. Um, but a lot of these are still not really fully proven in terms of their ability to be scaled. And they tend to be very, very expensive. So we can turn to other solutions that don't require new highly advanced technologies that are already well proven and that tend to be very cost effective. And these include restoring ecosystems and returning carbon to agricultural soils. It's a great um, solution because it doesn't require a lot of new or still um, undiscovered technology. It's something we can do with the knowledge that we already have. So before we dig deeper into mitigating climate change through agricultural soils. Um, let's take a look at what we as individuals can do in terms of reducing the greenhouse gas footprint of our own individual interactions with the food system. One of the best things that you can do is reduce your food waste. And this is one of my favorite ways to reduce my greenhouse gas footprint. Um, when you click on the link, you'll, you'll get a PDF of this presentation and you can click on the link there and see some great tips for how to reduce food waste. My favorite from this list is something that my boyfriend and I do every week, which is we have a leftovers day and we take all the leftovers out of the fridge and that's all we eat on, on Saturdays. And it's great since neither of us have to cook and we're really able to reduce the amount of food waste we generate each week. Another great thing to do is compost the waste that you can't avoid. Um, if you have municipal composting, this is easy, but you can also do that in your own backyard. Reducing your meat consumption is also something that can really lower your greenhouse gas footprint and it's great if you can seek out organically grown food since that food is gonna be grown without a lot of the harmful pesticides and the energy intensive inputs that are used in conventional food. And finally, if possible, seek out regeneratively grown foods. And for what exactly that means, well, we'll see further on in the presentation. So let's talk about the science of how does agriculture affect atmospheric carbon? There's a number of different connections and to understand them, I find it's really helpful to think of the carbon on Earth as being stored in several different pools. And I've put the main ones here on this slide. We have the oceans, the atmosphere, fossil fuels, and we have biota, which is all the life on Earth. I'm a biota, my dog, the trees outside the window, all the microorganisms in the air, the soil, etc. This is all biota. And then we have the soil, which is also, as you can see, a major carbon pool. So carbon, carbon's impacts really vary based on which of these pools they are in. The amount of carbon on the earth is not changing. There's no carbon that's being destroyed or spontaneously created, but it moves between these different pools. And when it's in certain pools, for example, the atmosphere or the oceans, it can produce really harmful effects. For example, in the atmosphere producing climate change or in the oceans where it's absorbed out of the atmosphere, producing acidification, which is really harmful for um, sea life like corals or um, creatures with, with shells that can dissolve those structures. So in some of these pools, carbon is really harmful, but carbon isn't always a bad thing. If it's in some of these other pools, like the biota or the soil, carbon can be really beneficial. In the biota, carbon is one of the main components that form the bodies or the structures of all living things. And when it's in the soil as organic matter, it can have other really beneficial effects as well. So how does um, agriculture mediate these pathways, these different arrows here, and move carbon around among these different pools? There's a few different ways. And the first one is through fossil fuel emissions. So I have a picture here of a tractor 
because one of the ways that agriculture contributes to fossil fuel emissions is through the use of farm equipment like the tractor that you see. However, this isn't the only way that agriculture contributes to fossil fuel emissions. And actually, probably more significant is the energy that's used to create the synthetic inputs in conventional agriculture. For example, one of the biggest synthetic inputs for conventional agriculture is synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. Now, nitrogen is really abundant in the Earth's atmosphere, but it's locked up in a form that can't easily be accessed by plants. Some plants um, partner with microorganisms to get that nitrogen out of the atmosphere and into a form they can use, but the other way that nitrogen is transformed from its atmospheric form into a form that plants can access is actually when a lightning, uh, a lightning bolt strikes and the energy from that lightning bolt going through the atmosphere splits up some of those nitrogen molecules and separates them into a form that plants can access. Just imagine how much energy there is in a lightning bolt and you can imagine how much fossil fuel energy has to go into creating that synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. So that's a, a major way the energy that's used to create those synthetic inputs is mostly going to be based on fossil fuel sources. And that's another major way that agriculture contributes to GHGs. The second way is through soil. So oxidation of carbon from the soil. In the soil, there's a lot of you know, dead microorganisms, dead plant material, and so on that's rich in carbon. As I mentioned, carbon forms the bodies of all that biota. So when that biota in the soil, the, um, the dead leaves and so on, is exposed to the oxygen in the atmosphere by plowing, turning that soil over, et cetera, the carbon combines with the oxygen, oxidizes, and becomes carbon dioxide, the most infamous greenhouse gas. Another pathway that goes through the soil is when that same synthetic nitrogen fertilizer that I mentioned earlier is applied, that can also interact with the oxygen in the atmosphere and oxidize and form um, nitrous oxide, which is an even more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And the third path is via livestock. And livestock produce, um, because of the way that they digest food, they have um, special bacteria in their guts that enable them to digest things like grass that you or I certainly can't eat. Um, but because they are able to eat this, they need these special microbes that basically ferment the grass in their guts. And this fermentation process produces methane, which is um, another greenhouse gas. And of course, there's also going to be nitrous oxide coming from the waste products of the cows. And again, oxidizing out into the atmosphere. So these three pathways are the main channels by which we see um, agriculture contributing to carbon flowing into the atmosphere but it's not just in that one direction, right? There's also ways that agriculture and plants in general can contribute to carbon moving out of the atmosphere and into the biota and eventually into the soil. And the main way this happens is through photosynthesis. So photosynthesis removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Plants use that carbon dioxide, they combine it um, with water and they use the energy from sunlight to create the structures of their bodies and to create sugars. And often those plants will feed those sugars that they've created from the carbon dioxide down into their roots where those sugars are used to feed microorganisms. And this is really nice of the plant, but it's actually kind of a, a trade where the plant provides these sugars and then microorganisms like fungi bring um, nutrients to the plant from further abroad in the soil than those plants' roots can reach. So it's a, it's a really cool example of a, a biological network that's happening right under our feet. So when you put more carbon into the soil through these sugars, more microorganisms are going to um, be able to live there in the soil, getting more nutrients, bringing more nutrients to the plants, which are gonna grow even bigger, and then engage in more photosynthesis, feed down more sugar, continue to vitalize that soil. And as those microorganisms grow, they'll be improving other aspects of the soil like structure, um, and basically, it's a really virtuous cycle. The more your soil health improves, the more carbon it can take up, and the more carbon that's in that soil, the more the soil health improves. And you can spiral upward and store more and more carbon. So I mentioned a few times the idea of healthy soil, and healthy soil is really important. As I said in the title, it's key to the healthy planet. But what does it mean to have healthy soil? So there's three ways I like to define healthy soil. Um, and I like to define it as structured, 
rich in organic matter, and most importantly, alive. So what do I mean when I say soil structure and why is that soil structure important? So a good soil structure is going to be sort of spongy, almost fluffy. If you pick up a handful of soil with a healthy structure, if you squeeze it, it'll hold together in a big clump. It won't just crumble away like dust. Um, and that's because a healthy soil with a healthy structure has different components like clay, organic matter, bacteria, um, which are producing sticky substances almost like glue, and fungal hyphae, which are the long skinny roots of the fungus that uh, weave throughout the soil. And these substances in the soil allow there to be aggregates in the soil. These are sort of clumps within the soil that hold it together and prevent it from blowing away. And that's what forms that spongy, fluffy structure of the soil. And just to illustrate how important structure is for soil function, um, in other words, all the things that we humans care about, like its ability to hold up buildings, its ability to filter water, all those functions, um, a 1% increase in soil organic matter, which is crucial to the structure of the soil, means that soil can hold 20,000 more gallons of water per acre than it otherwise could. And just imagine what a difference that can make to a farmer who is facing a drought if that soil has soaked up like a sponge those extra gallons of water. So organic matter, as I said, it's crucial to soil structure. Why does it support soil structure? Well, organic material, so things like dead leaves, dead microorganisms, roots of plants, even dead animals or um, animal waste in the soil, organic material like that can break down over time into a more stable, um, more stable molecules that are called organic matter or humus. And humus is a very complex uh, molecule that you can see in these pictures. Um, yeah, pretty much all I can tell from these images is that it's complicated, but that's correct. And it kind of looks like a tumbleweed or a coil of barbed wire. And because it has this complex shape, it's able to really hold on to things that come into the soil, whether that's nutrients or water. It sort of acts like a sieve or even maybe like a Velcro to hold those things in the soil and to hold the soil together. And because it's pulling all these things in the soil and allowing microorganisms and fungus to grow there, taking up those nutrients in water, it's really crucial to the function of the soil and its healthy structure. So all these things really work together. And what makes this all possible is the fact that the soil is alive. The soil is like a thriving city or even like a country in terms of how many different um, types of life there are in the soil. This beautiful, in my opinion, beautiful, some people might think it's a bit weird. Um, this beautiful picture is um, cultures of different fungus that was found in a soil sample. And you can see just from a single soil sample how many different kinds of fungus and microorganisms um, can be found there and the amazing variety of structures they can create. And so having this community working together means that the soil is really resilient. It has a lot of different things going on to protect it from shocks. And as I mentioned earlier, when there's more life in the soil, that means that it can take up more carbon. And as I keep coming back to, all those microorganisms and fungus are contributing to a strong and healthy soil structure, which means healthy soil function. So again, what can we do as individuals if we want to see this soil structure um, in our own lives, in our own backyards? We can definitely build our own soil at home. And if anyone gardens, um, they definitely know that it's crucial to build up your soil so that it has um, all these healthy attributes that I've been talking about. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. You can, for example, add native plants to your garden, which are going to work with your local soil type and with your local microbiology to help your soil um, become more healthy. You can garden with perennials, which reduce how much you have to disturb the soil year after year, um, which means that you can leave those microorganisms to develop in peace in your soil. Um, you can add compost or mulch, which is going to bring more organic material into your soil, which can then decompose into organic matter over time, which is really going to help your soil. You can avoid synthetic chemicals, which you know, avoids the harm that those synthetic chemicals might cause to the microbiology in your soil. And one of the other most important things is to reduce how much you're disturbing your soil. When you turn over that soil, it exposes the carbon in the soil to the atmosphere, which as we mentioned, 
can cause it to oxidize and escape into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So you can use um, no-dig gardening techniques, things like sheet mulching, no-dig beds, to really reduce how much you are tilling your own personal soil at home. So how do farmers achieve healthy soil? A lot of the techniques they use um, are similar to what you can use at home to create healthy soil in your own backyard, although, of course, on a, on a somewhat different scale. And for farmers who are trying to achieve healthy soil and who are trying to work with the ecosystem and give more than they take to, to the soil and to the planet, that collectively is called regenerative agriculture. So regenerative agriculture at its base is a farming strategy that focuses on rebuilding and improving the soil rather than just extracting from it. And another way to define it is as a suite of techniques, including things like reducing how much tillage you are using, adding compost, and using cover crops. Now, of course, these terms are really broad. And because this term is so broad, it can sometimes even be controversial. But most people agree that Regenerative agriculture includes some or all of the techniques that I'm about to discuss. So one of the techniques that's most popular with regenerative agriculture is using cover crops and compost to both protect the soil and add organic material, uh, using no-till or reduced tillage techniques to reduce disturbance to the soil, and using techniques that incorporate trees like agroforestry and silvopasture. So I'll go through each of these in a little more detail. Um, first, using cover crops and compost. This protects the soil. When uh, cover crops are grown, they're grown in between the cash crops. For example, if you're a farmer who grows uh, corn in the Midwest, you might grow corn only for certain months out of the year, and for the rest of those months, your soil might be left bare and exposed, which makes it vulnerable to erosion. Instead, if you grow a cover crop in those months, you can not only protect your soil and prevent it from blowing away, but you can add extra organic matter into the soil when that cover crop dies. And by having that cover crop covering the surface of the soil, you can make it easier for water to infiltrate into the soil as well. And depending on the type of cover crop you use, you can even have other benefits like improving the nitrogen levels of your soil or improving the texture and the structure of your soil. A lot of farmers engaged in regenerative agriculture also use reduced tillage. So in other words, they reduce or eliminate their use of plowing, turning over the soil, disking, tilling, um, and all those things that disturb the soil and chop up those structures within the soil. And um, this is important because, again, um, that disturbance of the soil structure is going to um, decrease its functionality. It's going to release carbon into the atmosphere. And um, when you till, you're also removing some of the crop residues, like the leftover stems and leaves that could instead go into the soil as organic material. Another way to reduce tilling is for farmers to also use perennial crops, so crops that live year after year and don't have to be replanted every year um, and thus don't require plowing to prepare the soil. And my favorite uh, area of techniques for regenerative agriculture would be those that involve trees. So I'll just mention a few of the different regenerative agriculture techniques involving trees here. Um, one, for example, is alley cropping. You can see that here where there is crops growing between rows of trees, thus the name alley cropping. Um, depending on what crops you're growing, this can even increase the overall economic returns on your land. The crops are shaded to some extent, but if you are growing, for example, a fruit or nut tree, you'll get an extra economic benefit from those trees as well, which can often more than make up for any losses of um, your ground crop, which in this case looks like it's a grain. Uh, another way you can incorporate trees into regenerative agriculture is with things like riparian buffers and hedgerows. In this picture, we see a riparian buffer, which is a strip of trees or woody plants like shrubs that are planted along the edges of a creek. And this um, not only provides a carbon sink in the biomass of those trees, it also is going to protect that water from erosion of the banks, um, from maybe pollution by animals that might be grazing in the field, and it's going to provide a habitat for beneficial insects and for wildlife. 
those insects might even help farmers reduce how much insecticide they need to use um, by keeping other insect populations under control. And then another really interesting way to pursue regenerative agriculture with trees is by creating a food forest or permaculture. And if food forest tries to um, kind of mimic and replicate the ecology of a forest with multiple different layers of different food producing plants, and by creating the sort of dense, abundant, interconnected ecosystem that you would see in a natural forest, this really reduces the amount of artificial inputs that are needed as the, all the ecological niches are kind of filled with plants that you want to see there. And there's not as much room for things like weeds or harmful insects. Um, and they're also just a beautiful example of a way to diversify the food growing on a given area of land and make that a lot more uh, resilient to disasters and a lot more productive for the local community. So all the techniques that I've talked about so far, the trees, the no-till, the cover crops, etc., cetera, um, are pretty widely recognized as being essential parts of regenerative agriculture. And the science on these is pretty consistent in terms of their benefits for drawing more carbon out of the atmosphere than they put in um, and for maintaining benefits to the ecosystems where they're practiced. But I want to take a minute or two to talk about something that's a little more complicated and a little more controversial, which is regenerative grazing. So most of the meat in the U.S. is produced for at least part of its lifespan in facilities called CAFOs, or Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. And that's what's pictured here. You can see these big crowds of cows, um, you know, having to live very close together. And because they're ruminants, they are fermenting um, in their guts, as I mentioned before, and producing methane, and their waste is producing nitrous oxide. Um, and, you know, they're clearly not, um, not living on a very healthy soil there. There's nothing much going on in that soil, which is continually being compacted um, by these animals. There's nothing growing there. So in order to address this, um, some farmers who aim to regenerate their land are working with a technique called regenerative grazing. And in this technique, rather than either roaming very widely um, over the same area of land for a long time or being raised in the concentrated animal feeding operation, um, grazing animals like cows are bunched together tightly and they're moved frequently between different subplots on whatever land they're grazing. And this aims to mimic the movement of things like bison herds. So when this is done correctly, um, this kind of grazing can stimulate the growth of grass on these areas. Um, it can stimulate especially the roots of that grass to grow quicker, putting more biomass into the soil. Um, it can bring more uh, beneficial microbes from the animal's waste. And in other words, it can really revitalize soil and cause it to become much more healthy, which can lead to some of the benefits I described, even, for example, carbon sequestration. In some cases, regenerative agriculture can even lead to enough carbon sequestration that for a period of time, um, that operation can be carbon negative. In other words, taking more carbon out of the atmosphere than it's putting in. But this um, has its limits because there's only a certain amount of carbon that soil can take up. Um, even under the best management practices, there's, there's physical limits to how much carbon can be absorbed by soil. So eventually, once the soil has been saturated with carbon, it's still the case that the animals grazing on this land are still ruminants, and so they're still producing methane, they're still producing nitrous oxide, but the soil is no longer taking up uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere any longer. So these kind of operations can't be carbon negative forever. And it's also important to recognize that while they definitely bring some benefits to land, especially if that land was previously degraded, it's also possible that that might not be the best use for that land. Maybe that land would be better used for wildlife habitat, or maybe it would be better used for direct production of food that the people can eat directly. Not all land is suitable for either of those things though, and for some land grazing is an excellent use. So the bottom line here is that while regenerative grazing can offset some of the negative impacts of grazing and of animal agriculture, um, even while you may seek out regeneratively grown meat to try to reduce the impact of the meat you eat, um, 
and that's a totally valid strategy for improving your impact on the food system, you can also keep in mind that reducing the total amount of meat that you're consuming is one of the best things that you can do to reduce your greenhouse gas footprint. So just to summarize, um, conventional farming often relies on a lot of tillage, usually has a lot of exposed soil when a cash crop or a, a production crop isn't being grown, usually has a lot of monocrops, relies on synthetic uh, inputs, ranching is going to be feedlots, CAFOs, um, and it's often unfortunately very destructive of the ecosystem. On the other hand, regenerative farming uses different techniques. We see techniques like no-till or reduced tillage, the use of compost and cover crops to protect the soil and add organic matter, uh, emphasis on biodiversity and soil life, uh, management of pests that doesn't rely on synthetic inputs, integrating animals in a, beneficial, um, in a beneficial way, and overall an attempt to restore the ecosystem in which it's happening. And just to give an idea of the impact of regenerative agriculture, um, I'll show a couple numbers and estimates here. Uh, because study of regenerative agriculture is somewhat recent, there is, and, and because it takes place in natural systems, which aren't always fully predictable, there's a lot of different estimates for the potential of regenerative agriculture to, to um, mitigate climate change and to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. But one of the numbers I like here is realistic scaling up of ag conservation practices could probably remove 75 um, teragrams of carbon per year by 2050, assuming that we're gradually scaling up towards 2050. By 2050, we'd be able to remove 75 teragrams of carbon per year. And this is offsetting about half, or this would be offsetting about half of the greenhouse gas emissions from US agriculture, which is pretty impressive. And aside from just these numbers about greenhouse gases, one of the most exciting things, in my opinion, about regenerative agriculture is that it's not a case where you have to give up on a lot of good things and not get anything in return for reducing your greenhouse gas footprint. It actually has a lot of co-benefits. So other benefits that don't have anything to do with, um, with the carbon, carbon benefits. For example, um, growing cover crops in the off season of your farm and reducing the synthetic pesticides that you're using is great for protecting pollinators like this cute little carpenter bee here. Um, the benefits from this are also going to include water retention. So these same practices that grow the fertility of the soil are also growing water retention and that means that there's going to be less events of harmful flooding, for example, and um, better health of our estuaries and marine areas. And finally, especially in those techniques I mentioned that involve trees or that involve um, maybe woody or shrubby borders to fields and waterways, it has a real impact on biodiversity and wildlife habitat. So especially if you use native trees, for example, it's going to provide habitat to all kinds of birds, small mammals, et cetera. Just to give us a really nice successful example of regenerative agriculture, um, one place that I really like is Singing Frogs Farm. This is a 10 year old eight acre farm in Sebastopol. It's certified as bee friendly, so it's good for pollinators. And coming back to the social impacts that I mentioned earlier about how agriculture isn't just about science, it's also about people. They're able to employ their employees year round because they're a diversified farm that's producing a variety of different crops. And this means that those employees have much more stable employment, much more stable livelihoods. And just to prove that you don't have to sacrifice productivity in order to engage in these practices, they have produced six times the California average of the vegetable harvest every year. So, you know, it's one of those maybe um, seemingly hard to find examples where you can get, um, get your cake and eat it as well, except in this case, maybe I should say, get, get your kale and eat it too. So what can we do as individuals to improve the situation for regenerative agriculture in California? I think a lot of people want to support it and there's definitely ways to do that even if you do not want to go out and uh, buy a farm. So one way is to use consumer power and this you can think of it as voting with your dollars or voting with your fork, which I think is much more fun. Um, you can seek out and buy food that's grown in these sustainable regenerative ways. And one way to do that is by signing up for a CSA, a community supported agriculture box, 
which is basically like a subscription box for your fruits and vegetables. And if you seek out a regenerative farm and subscribe to get their produce um, every month, for example, or every week, this is economically going to support that farm. And because you've sought out a single farm to build this relationship with, you can really be knowledgeable about their practices. Um, probably not right now with the pandemic going on, but a lot of farms will welcome customers to come and see what kind of practices they're using to build their soil and to um, improve the health of their fields. And that's a great, uh, a great feeling to really know where your food is coming from right down to, you know, what did the soil look like when I visited last week? And another way for consumers to engage is by seeking out regenerative organic certified foods. So there's a certification that's been developed, it just finished its piloting stage, and this will be a certification hopefully showing up in grocery stores soon that identifies food that was grown using all the practices that I mentioned before, or at least some of those practices. So looking for the certification, um, hopefully in a grocery store near you soon. Um, but we talked about, you know, what can we do as individuals to support this movement? And we can do a lot, but it shouldn't all just be on us to support this individually. Our government and our legislatures should also be doing what they can to support regenerative agriculture. So what is happening in this respect? Well, I'm really proud to say that um, California is actually a great example of um, of uh, policy support for regenerative agriculture. We have some um, policies around that that are really an excellent example within the US and even globally, they could be considered uh, a pretty good example of support for regenerative agriculture. So one example of this is a suite of policies called Climate Smart Agriculture. This includes um, four programs, including the Healthy Soils Program, of course, supporting healthy soils, the SWEET program supporting sustainable water use, the AMP program supporting sustainable manure management, and the Sustainable Agriculture Lands Conservation Program, which is uh, supporting conservation of, of land that's being used uh, for sustainable agriculture to prevent it from being um, you know, turned into urban development. Another great example of California's support that really gives me hope is uh, Governor Newsom's recent executive order and it recognized the importance of soil health and directed state agencies to make soil health part of their part of their future planning for how California can achieve its greenhouse gas goals. And this also comes into play in the California Air Resources Board planning. Um, they're working on identifying how California can achieve the goals that we've already set for reducing our greenhouse gas emissions over the coming decade. And they are including um, agriculture and agricultural soils as an important part of that plan. So all these together um, are a really hopeful picture, but I have to say that this is not always only positive. For example, the Healthy Soils Program is extremely popular with farmers but because of the fiscal crisis caused by COVID-19, there's actually no funding for Healthy Soils Program for next year, which means that all the farmers that were hoping to use this funding to transition into more sustainable practices aren't going to be able to do it. And that's because most of these programs don't have permanent funding. Their funding is identified on a year-to-year -year basis and they don't always get funding. So there's still a lot of work to do in terms of lobbying for more stable funding for these programs and identifying better ways that we as a state and as a nation can be supporting this, this urgent transition to regenerative agriculture. So specifically, um, there's a lot of things that we can do as individuals around this topic. We can be a raising awareness of healthy soils. You can tell your friends, you can tell your neighbors, you can tell random people. I talked to my bank teller a few months ago about the importance of healthy soils. You can raise awareness of healthy soils like that. You can support healthy soil policies whenever you see them on the ballot. Um, but you can also reach out to your representatives directly and hold them accountable, especially in a state like California where agriculture is so important and where we've often led the way as a state on sustainability in the US. Um, there's no reason why we can't be doing more to support regenerative agriculture. So reach out to your representatives and ask them, what are you doing to support farmers who want to be responsible environmental stewards? What are you doing to bring California's agricultural soils up to their potential for mitigating climate change? 
those are appropriate questions to ask, um, and I wish more people would, would ask those questions. One uh, organization that I really like that's working on these policy areas is California Climate and Agriculture Network, CalCAN, and they have a website where you can check if they have action alerts. Um, so I highly recommend to check that out to see where you might be able to advocate. And then there's a lot of ways that you can continue to learn more about this topic. Um, you know, we covered quite a bit in this, in this talk, but we really only scratched the surface of how our food system can be transformed into something that's more sustainable, that's more equitable, that's more healthy, and that's better for the environment. So I highly recommend that you check out these resources. One of my favorites is Civil Eats. It's an online website, online magazine, and they have tremendous variety of stories about agriculture and about the food system. And they really are um, really going to give some expert analysis on some of the social issues as well that we didn't have time to cover in this talk, as well as the environmental issues. And then I'd also recommend um, An Invitation for Wildness, which is a great short documentary available on YouTube um, about food forests and permaculture. And then finally, Kiss the Ground is a documentary. It recently came out on Netflix, so it's pretty accessible. And, um, you know, while it does take a somewhat optimistic view of some of the issues like regenerative grazing that we got into a bit more in depth in this presentation, it's a great general introduction to the concepts here. And it's really engaging and it's a great way to share this information with other people in your life who might be interested. So there is a wealth also of, of civil society and nonprofit groups that you can check out. Um, Highly recommend all of these to, to get into learning more. And finally, um, if there are any questions, I would love to answer those. And you can keep in touch by checking out our Facebook page, our website, um, or emailing me with this email. Thanks. Well, thank you, Mary. Uh, that was that was a a great deep dive, well past the weeds, and, <laughs> and uh, um, we have been joined uh, um, by a few different people. I, I'm just checking uh, if there are uh, any any questions uh, for Mary. Um, from uh, the people that navigated all the URL contention to get here. Um, we will be, uh, re we are recording this and we'll be posting it uh, online and uh, making uh, people aware of that, uh, you know, as well. So if you uh, were a little um, late getting in, we uh, have you covered. Um, so, one question I, I have, I, you was actually more on the, uh, you know, on the budget side. I know uh, you you mentioned that there was uh, some, uh, well, basically things, uh, program funds had uh, kind of dried up in um, that uh, particular budget. I wondered if there were, um, just between, you know, well, just uh, what does the federal landscape look like? Yeah, um, I think that, I mean, hopefully we'll see lots of changes at the federal level, although it's hard to say. Um, I would mention that there is definitely pretty broad support at the federal level um, for programs that pay farmers to sequester carbon. Um, this, it, it really depends on who you ask though, how they wanna see that happen. So some people are interested in seeing a direct payment to farmers for carbon sequestration, um, kind of like what you might see here with the national, national resource conservation programs that pay farmers, for example, to conserve sensitive lands rather than farming them and they just pay them directly for that. Other people want to see something more like a government supported national carbon credit marketplace that's going to pay farmers um, for those the carbon sequestration by selling that carbon sequestration to private businesses as carbon credits. And 
personally, I prefer the first model that doesn't involve carbon credits because when someone's buying carbon credits, it means that they're kind of excusing themselves for producing those carbon emissions anyway, which they should probably be trying not to do. Um, but I do think, I mean, both will see more money flowing to farmers that engage in these practices. And I think that's a positive thing. Um, so yeah, I, I think that programs like that would be something to look at on the horizon. And there is existing federal support already for farmers engaging in practices that conserve the soil. A lot of those were developed um, around the time of the, the Great Depression to try to prevent that kind of thing happening in the future. Uh, yes, I noticed uh, that um, one of the stalwarts in terms of agricultural policy, Colin Peterson, uh, is a Democrat from uh, Minnesota, uh, who's been head of uh, um, House Agricultural Committee for quite a while, um, was not reelected. And ah. um, he had uh, a certain set ideas, I would say, I think, mm -hmm. uh, um, as delicately as I put it. Um, and uh, uh, there, I, I think there had been, uh, you know, obviously a very big ag focus, uh, actually more almost of a monoculture um, focus out of a lot of the um, ag policy. Um, mm. And obviously in California, that is uh, kind of a, a much different uh, landscape, um, just as far as um, you know, so many specialty crops and, and fruit and, uh, um, you know, basically the fruit and nuts and, you know, just even Brussels sprouts and things, you know, where... Yeah, California has a very unusual agricultural landscape. Yeah. In fact, like a third of agriculture in California actually is organic, whereas nationally it's like 3% is organic. So it is important to remember that we do live kind of in a bubble in California. It's very different than the national, um, national perspective on ag. And also speaking of um, federal personnel involved with agriculture, I'm, uh, well, I, I'm not personally super uh, enthused about, about Mr. Vilsack, who has, who again, as you said, has more of a focus on, on big agriculture. So that's also something to be watching out for. But I, I don't know if I should be talking about my personal uh, political yes, opinion that, so well. Right. I won't that, do that. Uh, uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, uh, a possible appointee. I know it's it, it has been a, a kind of a controversial, um, uh, controversial uh, pick, or I don't know if it's official, uh, kind of officially picked. A lot of times they'll put kind of names out uh, uh, to gauge reaction, and from what I can tell, the reaction has not been uh, uh, very good in a lot of quarters, but. Uh, mm. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see about, uh, see about that. Um, the, uh, uh, and so another, uh, kind of question that came up, um, was more about, I mean, you know, we're talking about agriculture and then almost national federal policy, California policy, but what about our backyards? Yeah. Like very local policy. Um, I think there's some good examples of that um, as well. And one example that springs to mind is the Santa Clara County's, um, I think, oh gosh, I forget what it was called, but um, they recently have approved a grant program in Santa Clara County um, that supports farmers. And it's, it's along similar lines to the Healthy Soils program. I think it might even use the same criteria but it's additional grants for farmers in that county who want to transition to some of these practices. Um, and so that's a great example of how this kind of action can occur on the local level as well, um, at the county level. I know Marin County also has a climate plan um, for reducing their climate impacts and for uh, adapting to future climate impacts, and that really centers agriculture. Um, and so, yeah, local level is totally a uh, valid target for, for uh, advocacy. Well, um, uh, yes, and actually it's an interesting, you, you took, um, uh, I, I, I basically do want to ask it again because, the question again, because uh, you, you took it in an, an interesting direction, I, I didn't realize. And obviously, for instance, in, um, 
Oh, you meant like literally in your backyard. Coastside. Well, I mean, let's continue this. Uh, San Mateo <laughs> County Coastside is uh, uh, quite a, a strong agricultural area. Um, uh, you know, just a lot of uh, um, anyone who visits, uh, I'll, I'll say the uh, College of San Mateo Farmer's Market, which is <laughs> quite a large one. Um, yeah is uh, aware of the farms of Pescadero, for instance, uh, or Greater Pescadero, which, um, and, and they've, in the past few years, I mean, they've been, you know, producing all kinds of great stuff, including things, I mean, you know, it's one thing about cool weather crops and everything, you know, in that part of the coast, but, but even like early girl tomatoes and, and um, that are dry farmed, you know, that are, uh, really, uh, really nice uh, uh, produce, but but actually, my question was literally about people's backyards. Right. And, Sorry about that. And uh, just as far as um, uh, resources there, and any kind of thoughts about uh, the soils, uh, you know, people improving their soils. I mean, there's a lot of there has been over the past few years a lot of lawn ripping up. Mm. Um, personally, I know that was something we did 19 years ago. <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah. And so we would have had to plant new or plant new lawn, you know, it was super highly thatched. It was like, like very big, you know, thatch. And um, it, it was basically past its useful life. And, and we ripped out everything and, and redid. And, and it was a, you know, a, just a great uh, experience real. I mean, it, I slept well for a long time, but anyway, it, it, uh, um, there's been a lot of that and, and, uh, you know, obviously any, any kind of thoughts about people, uh, improving, um, you know, their little patches in terms of, uh, how they grow. Yeah, totally. So I think getting rid of your lawn is a great idea, especially because lawns typically, um, you know, to keep them looking in the fresh, green, smooth, state that they prefer to be in, you have to use a lot of synthetic pesticides, a lot of synthetic fertilizers. You have to use the, uh, the lawnmower all the time. Um, so yeah, getting rid of your lawn is great. It's great to replace it with a food garden. It's great to replace it with maybe something like clover that's going to be good for local pollinators. Um, there's a lot of great options around that. And then if you are you know, interested in, in something more advanced, you can grow your own food at home. Or if you want more of an ornamental garden, um, you know, that actually in some ways even brings more options for uh, regenerative gardening. If you, if you don't need to be planting over year after year and harvesting, you can inc include a lot more perennials, you can include more native plants. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some great resources about that. It's not really my um, area of expertise, but I do know of some great resources that I can connect people with. Um, and I can send those to you, Dennis, that you can, you can send out afterwards. Um, but yeah, and I, I see here. Oh, you're uh, looking at the chat. So question it, from Marilyn. <laughs> yes, uh, I was just going to address that, but, but please go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So yeah, Marilyn asked, can you share the recording and is there a resource document? Um, as far as I'm concerned, you can. Dennis, is it okay if they share the, the recording? Uh, well, sure. We'll be posting, uh, we'll be posting it shortly. And uh, um, both, it, it, it ultimately, it, we have a YouTube channel where we, we do put these talks and then we feature them on our website uh, as well. And we also, uh, Mary will, will have a PDF of the presentation up which is really useful in this case because Marion packs it full of um, URLs and things too. So, I mean, it's the equivalent of almost a paper with footnotes. So, um, and I think yeah. that's really uh, nice and, uh, you know, wealth, uh, where, uh, worthy of a, a good scan because uh, oh, thanks. you can definitely go off into a number of different uh, sites based on that. Yeah, and I, I think some of those links will be useful. And then, um, especially around home gardening, since that's not something I dug into much in this talk, I can um, send some other additional links um, uh, specifically about that for people who are interested in that. And then I'll also recommend, um, there is, a, I recently gave a presentation at an agency called Lingso Garden 
supply or links to ah, garden yes. materials Let and they have a lot of gardening like classes um, that are focused on sustainable gardening so I think they have classes on uh, on no dig and no till home gardening and composting which might be interesting for people to check out yeah no they're in uh, a San Mateo County institution for sure and yeah. uh, um, see them every time I go north on 101 <laughs> yeah yeah and uh, um, they they're a great resource for uh yeah for classes and hardscape and you know just everything as far as a uh, kind of a home uh garden yeah. and uh, actually even for uh good advice too i mean they're they're, they're good in that uh, regard and uh, uh you know and they're not alone i mean you know garden centers throughout uh are, are generally uh real helpful uh mm. you know in, in in a lot of ways um, but thanks Marilyn, well, but, but they're they're really top of the mark though i mean so yeah um, and I'd, I'd be thrilled if you want to share this with your with your regenerative gardening class um that would be that would be great and uh, one other plug for i mentioned the sustainable life program that we're going to be rolling out and uh it is so it since it's it's basically looking to mainstream sustainability and everything um you know, uh, both food in terms of, uh, um, you know, where you're sourcing it, but also growing it. And, and so uh, now um, um, Mary, Mary is a, a classic example, I, I suppose, of uh, not, not doing much um, backyard gardening. Uh, no, I live in an apartment, but, so I don't have a backyard. Yeah, so, uh, um, um, but, uh, you know that uh, aspect is, is is quite good as well as well as hydroponic stuff. We're we're going. We'll have uh, uh, some good information on that. I uh, I've had a, a. I'm through my. I just finished my crop of hydroponic cucumbers, that uh, uh, a friend of ours, uh, Twin Vo, has uh, been uh, um, working on on hydroponic kits that uh, have been. Uh, have grown quite a bit so it looks like we're going to transition to um leafy greens for the winter all right are there any other questions from uh from audience members well there was a marilyn also had a follow-up question about uh, uh a good resource for building your microbiome in the soil mm, um so yeah if we're interested in resources let me go ahead and drop a link to the website right in the chat because we actually have on our website a resource page which has some lists of different resources and i believe there is a list about soil there which you can check out um but yeah i can i can also send some links to recommended resources to dennis um after after the talk because that's definitely something that is useful for the home gardener. So if you if you go to this link here, um, sierraclub.org slash California slash CNRCC slash sustainable dash agriculture, um, you'll be able to find some resource lists there, which might be able to uh, be of use. And it looks like this. Ah, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so if you see the uh, check out our resource lists here, um, you'll be able to check out some resource lists there. Ah, and there's your event, right? right. Yeah. So, um, well, at, at, at this point, uh, I just want to check on any other uh, questions, or if not, we can go off into the... Okay, well, um, I, thank you, Mary. This has been great. Uh, um, uh, chock full of information and uh, um, we'll get busy about uh, uh, getting the video up and uh, making sure that uh, uh, it gets seen. Yeah, well, I just want to say thank you to, to you for, uh, for hosting and thanks to everyone for attending. It's always a real honor to be able to share this, um, to share this information with people. Great. Thank you uh, for both Marilyn and I <laughs> reading the chat, uh, Marilyn. Yeah. Thank you oh, so and much. And, I, I actually, um, 
I actually was wondering one more question. I hope this isn't too uh, forward, but Marilyn, I've never heard of a high school regenerative, agri uh, regenerative gardening class. Um, do you mind if I reach out to you to learn more about that? Hopefully that, hopefully that would be fine. Charter school. It's a charter yeah. school and she, uh, and she and probably they would love it. Okay, great. Well, I imagine I'll be able to get your email address from um, from your sign up for the for the webinar. So I will reach uh, out to you. Yes, soon. Marilyn. Uh, just uh, uh, in, unless you uh, have any paramount uh, disagreements on that, I will uh, facilitate. So thanks again, Mary, and uh, bye for now. Great. Thank Take you so much, everyone. Dennis. Have a great afternoon, everyone.